Hello and welcome to the ADH Dumpster Fire Crime Edition. Ooh, a relaxing experience of me telling you about the best plot twisty crime cases I find, whilst actually I should be doing more important things. Hi, I am your host Jurika van Wichen, which yes, is a very hard to pronounce Dutch name, but because it low-key sounds like Eureka? A lot of non-Dutch speakers just call me that, so do with that information what you will. <laughs> but wait, weren't you like a mental health channel or like you did stuff with hair and then you also uploaded a video of you impersonating Snow White? Like girl, maybe make up your mind, I don't know. Well, if you're new here, uh, feel free to skip ahead to the actual story because I can imagine that you just clicked on this for the story and now you're like, I don't really care about why you're doing this today, but I feel like I need to explain to the three subscribers that I already have why we're doing a true crime feature today. So yeah, feel free to skip ahead to when the actual story starts and maybe hopefully by the end of it you've enjoyed it so much that maybe next time you won't skip ahead. Who knows? Who knows? So, let me explain. Um, having a video ready every week that I'm actually proud of and that won't make me look like a twat it's actually pretty hard man <laughs> like it's so much fun and I love doing it but you know sometimes you have ideas for videos and they just don't work out at all or my computer decides it's fed up and annoyed with my newfound passion for YouTube laptop really hates me right now <laughs> So yeah, coming up with something that actually will work and that you will actually like is a task. <laughs> and on the other hand, I keep having ideas for other videos that I could do here on the YouTubes. I've laid in bed awake at night at 3am pondering about whether I should start an ASMR channel or a channel where I do weird movie reviews and also true crime videos because I cannot stop watching true crime YouTubers and documentaries. And I wouldn't say I'm obsessed because everyone's always like, oh my God, I'm so obsessed with true crime. Ah. No, I would rather say that it's more a full-blown addiction. <laughs> I cannot stop watching. And then a few days ago, when this week's video attempt fell through again, which was just great, I figured why not actually make myself useful and instead of procrastinating on making videos by watching true true crime YouTubers? Why not make the videos about true crime? And then I figured I should also probably do that on a separate channel because otherwise the algorithm is really not going to get what I'm trying to do here but hey, neither do I, so um, and I realised I don't actually really care, so here we are. Now, having thought of this new plan, I obviously got way overexcited and within three hours of thinking of the idea, I had a massive list with 32 true crime cases that I hadn't seen a lot on the internet before and that all have very good plot twists. Yeah, hyperfocus is a curse and a blessing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, now I have a list with all this content just ready to go. And I actually really loved making this video, so might do this every week now and upload other random videos like the ones I did before in between. Or you know, just something completely different because <laughs> let's be honest, I can keep saying what I'm gonna do on this channel, but we all know that my brain will pull a you know reverse card on us all and maybe next month I'll be doing videos about hatching a store-bought chicken egg. Should I? Who knows guys? Who the fuck knows? <laughs> Google if possible to hatch store-bought egg at home question mark. So for today's video I have picked a case that I miraculously hadn't heard about because that's very rare at this point and it's a story with the most bizarre plot twist and I know I put in a very clickbaity title but it's actually insane. So what I did is I did a lot of research. I actually linked down my sources below and I wrote down a whole script thinking of the best way storytelling wise to tell this story because I feel like everyone that I did find doing this story always tells it in the same way and what I'm about to tell you is actually a document on my computer that consists of five, fifth, oh, I can't do numbers, 5,593 words. My teachers would be amazed because I had the biggest trouble writing essays. And now I typed a whole document of 50, for, oh, I can't do numbers, 5,593 words, including adding all the sources I used. So yeah, I was actually very surprised myself. I really love doing it. So I definitely think I'm going to do this more often because it's fun. So 
So yeah, that's why we're here and with all that said, let's get into the story. No, wait, crap. <laughs> First I have to do the disclaimer thingy they always do. Okay, hold on. Warning. <clears throat> <clears throat> Warning. <clears throat> Warning. This video contains graphic depictions of sexual assault, drug abuse, blood, needles, and disturbing scenarios. Viewer discretion is advised. So yeah, if you feel like that's not for you today, then I'm proud of you for making that decision for yourself. And feel free to watch my other content until I um, see you next week. Okay, so now let's actually get into the story. Now the story actually takes place in the early 90s in a small farm town called Kipling, located in Saskatchewan. I practiced, I practiced a small farm town <laughs> called Kipling, located in Saskatchewan, Canada. Nailed it. And actually, the events of this story take place on Halloween night in 1992. <gasps> now, Kipling was a very small town and it only had about 1,000 residents, one cafe, one supermarket, a handful of restaurants and one hospital. It was the kind of town where, you know, everybody knew each other and overall it was just a very pleasant and quiet town to live in. And in this town lived a lovely family called the Schneebergers. Now, I did look this up because Holland being located next to Germany, my brain was thinking, isn't this pronounced Schneeberger? But I looked up and they called themselves the Schneebergers, so Schneeberger it is. Now John Schneeberger was actually born in Zambia in Africa, which at the time was still called North Rhodesia. I really did my research. Now John grew up a bright and very kind young boy in a prestigious but very loving family that also valued education. Now just like his older brother Bill, when John was a bit older, he got accepted into the Medical University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. And he was so happy that just like his brother, he got to study medicine and his family were very proud of him. Now, John was a straight A student and in December of 1984, he graduated with flying colors, actually being honored best in his class on the subject of anesthesiology. And then in 1987, John wanted something new. So he immigrated to Canada and you guessed it, he moved to the town we talked about before Kipling, Saskatchewan, Canada. Now once there he quickly completed certification requirements to practice medicine in Canada and in 1988 he joined the Kipling Medical Centre as actually one of Kipling's only two physicians at the time. Now working there as a doctor John was immediately well known around town. He was a very well liked doctor that people actually really enjoyed to visit. And not long after he started working at the hospital, he meets a lovely lady there called Lisa Dillman. Now Lisa and John, they fell head over heels in love with each other. And after four years of dating, they got married in 1991. Lisa already had two kids of her own from a previous marriage. And John immediately took them in as his own children. And Lisa's kids in return absolutely adored John. And soon enough, he was often seen at the sidelines of their sports competitions, cheering them on. And soon enough, John and Lisa would actually have two daughters of their own, born only a year apart from each other. So they were in love. And everyone in town would always speak so fondly of the Schneeberger family because they were the kind of family that was always involved in helping the town's less fortunate. John exceeded at family medicine but quickly he saw a desperate need and a big gap for more medical specialization in his community. So despite having a full-time job and being a father of four, John decided that he wanted to specialize in obstetrics and gynecology. So he went along and did this and in 1992 at 38 years old he completed his academic. John also helped raise money for a communal swimming pool and he helped start up a sexual education module at the local high school. So John was just really involved in improving the people's health and John would be described by everyone as someone who just truly cared about the needs and the problems of Kipling's residents but also for the future generations of the town. But soon however John's happy family story would take a very sad and dark turn. On Halloween night in 1992, John is working his night shift at the local hospital when a very upset and distressed woman walks into the hospital and a concerned nurse takes her to John's office. John, he sees how distressed she is, so he talks with her and he tries to calm her down, ask her what happened. But when the woman really can't seem to calm down, John offers her to give her a sedative and she says, yeah, I think I would actually like that. Now, when he gives her the sedative though, it seems to hit the woman pretty hard 
heart and she ends up just passing out and falling asleep. So John's like, okay, I'll just inform the nurses that are on duty that this woman can stay the night at this hospital until she's, you know, calmed down. And then he just resumes with his night shift. He does some paperwork, he sees some other patients, etc. Now, when the woman wakes up the next morning, she still looks a bit upset and a bit confused. But John thinks she's fit enough to go home, so she's released and that's that. But then, a few days later, John actually gets a phone call from the police. And the police tell him that this woman is actually accusing him of drugging her and then sex assaulting her. They tell him that she had gone to a center for sexual assault and the lab results had determined that there was DNA found on her body. So they asked John to voluntarily come up to the police station and give a DNA sample. Now John and his family are beyond shocked at what the police just told him and says yes of course I'll come to the station and give you a sample. And so the police thank him and he goes over to the station and when he was there he was very polite and cooperative and just very glad to have this newfound DNA technology on his side to prove his innocence so that it wouldn't have to be his word against hers. Now DNA testing was fairly new in the early 90s but it was already very solid and trustworthy and had been solving many crimes over the past few years. So they take his blood and the sample gets tested and soon enough John gets a call a few days later telling him that DNA indeed wasn't a match to the DNA found on the woman's body. Additionally they had questioned the nurses that were on duty that night and also nothing came out of that and they tell John he's now free of all charges and now obviously John already knew he was innocent but the family was just so relieved that this nightmare was finally over because it had been very hard on them especially because they always made their best efforts to help the community didn't understand why anyone would want to attack them However, the woman that had accused John of all this was so determined that she was assaulted that night and that it 100% could not have been anybody else but John. So she went back to the police and she requested another DNA test just to make sure the other one wasn't tempered with. And now the police are like, well, we took his blood, but apparently you can officially request that. So they went back to John and now John's wife, Lisa, she was just devastated. She was so heartbroken that there was this woman out there trying to ruin her husband's life. And she was also very scared of her family's safety and John, even though very concerned himself, he comforted her and he told her that he would just go back to the station and voluntarily give them his DNA and that just everything would be okay. And so he does, he agrees to have his DNA taken and he goes to the station and this time, just to verify that it really wasn't tempered with, there's actually two lawns again. John was being very kind, very polite and cooperative. They take his blood sample. The law enforcement officers would actually stand up very close to see, well, you know, the thing happening. The sample gets taken to the lab and that's carefully observed by the law officers as well. And then again, a few days later, John gets the call saying his DNA wasn't a match to the DNA found on this woman's body. And now at this point, John and his family were so ready to move on from this whole thing that they were so relieved that now it was actually over. He had given his DNA twice. He didn't do anything and the police had to move on. And people from the neighborhood came up apologizing to them for what had happened to them. And most of them never really doubted the family, but still apologized if there ever was like a little sense of doubt because they just felt horrible that this was happening to this lovely family and because the police couldn't find anything other on the case of this woman unfortunately for her but fortunately for the Schneeberger family in 1994 the case went cold now let's actually talk about the woman that accused John of all this because she was actually called Candace Fonagy and she was a 22 year old mother of one Candace along with her recently born baby daughter also lived in Kipling Saskatchewan see how good I'm recovering at pronouncing that name Saskatchewan now on the evening of Halloween night 1992 Candace was working at the local gas station and during her shift her boyfriend at the time actually pulled by and they got into a huge fight Candace actually had recently found out that he was cheating on her so she was feeling very betrayed and heartbroken and frustrated and upset with him so they got into a big fight and she sent her boyfriend away at some point and when her shift was done she figured I have a babysitter at home I don't need to go home right now I think I'll just go to the hospital where actually her best friend worked as a nurse. When she got to the hospital though, it turned out that her friend actually wasn't working that night and obviously they only had landlines, no mobile phones. And Candace was just 
like, okay, well, I'll just go home. But Candace actually appeared so distressed and upset that the nurses that were working there were concerned about her and asked if maybe she wanted to see a doctor. And Candace agrees because she is crying hysterically and also doesn't really feel like it would be safe to drive home right now. So she goes to the waiting room and shortly after, a friendly face walked in. And as we know, that friendly face was Dr. John Schneeberger. Now, they actually already knew each other because he had delivered her baby not long before. So she's actually quite relieved to see him and she tells him about the fight with her boyfriend and how she's just feeling so upset and devastated right now. And John, being the good person that he is, he listens to her, he let her talk, and then he offers her a sedative to maybe make her feel more at peace and be able to calm down a little so she could drive home. And Candace is just feeling so devastated that she's like, yeah, please, give me the sedative. I want to go home to my child, but I am obviously in no state to drive right now and I would love to calm down. So John gets up and he starts preparing a syringe and Candace remembers thinking, huh, I thought he was just going to give me a pill of some sort. I wasn't expecting a needle, but then she also thought I'm probably overthinking it and she just really wanted some peace and quiet. So she didn't say anything and John proceeded to inject her with the sedative. However, just a few seconds after he's injected her with this sedative, Candace feels her entire body starting to go numb. Soon she also realized that if she wanted to move, she couldn't because she didn't have control over her muscles anymore. Now the sedative that he had given her is called Verset and Verset is actually used in surgical procedures to actually makes the patient go paralyzed. However, it does not put the mind to sleep. So when Candace is laying there and she can't move, she's actually 100% aware of everything that's happening around her and her eyes were actually wide open. And then she feels that she's been rolled to the side and sexually assaulted. Now, she couldn't actually see her attacker, but Candace would later say that she could compare it most with when you get a teeth pulled out and they sedate you and you can't feel the pain, but you can feel the pressure of the procedure. So yeah, and because of how this Versed drug was working, even though she was laying there completely paralyzed, she was 100% aware of what was going on. And even though she wasn't able to actually see her attacker, John was the only one in the room. So it had to have been him, right? And then she remembered the assault stopping and being put in a bed and she was feeling so tired and a bit daisy because the drug actually does make you very tired. So she ends up falling asleep. And the next morning when she wakes up, she's obviously very upset about what had happened to her. And John, who was actually doing his rounds that morning, he came in to see her and he was being very normal and asking her how she was doing and if she'd slept all right and if she needed anything. And this really confused her because she was 100% sure that the night before he had attacked her. But she doesn't say anything and she does ask, what did you give me last night? And John notices that she looks like she's not feeling very safe. So he says, oh, don't worry. It was just something to calm you down. Nothing to worry about. There were three nurses on duty who came to check on you multiple times during the night. Don't worry, you're, you're, you're safe. Candace was not able to believe that nothing had happened. She was so sure that it did. And he was the only one in the room with her. It had to have been him. Now she gets discharged and actually Candace was really smart because even though she felt traumatized, she knew she had to be quick to secure evidence to have any chance at all at people believing her. She went to a clinic about two hours away in a town called Regina. And yes, I've looked it up. It's not pronounced Regina. It's actually pronounced Regina, so. <laughs> Now at this clinic for sexual assault, she told her story and they took a lot of swaps from all over her body. And Candace taught them that she had not had any intercourse in the weeks leading up to this moment. So actually when sperm was found on her nether regions and underwear, they immediately called the police. And then the rest is history because as we know, John volunteered to give his DNA twice. And both times it showed that he could not be matched to the DNA found on Candace's body. Now unfortunately, this really didn't put Candace in a very good light within the community of Kipling. Many people thought she was doing it for attention, that she was after his money, that she was a gold digger. And obviously Candace really didn't feel welcome anymore. So she decided she would take her daughter, leave the town she was born and raised in and move to Regina, the town where she'd gotten her swaps done. 
And in the next few months, Candace was happy that she wasn't living in Kipling anymore, but she was still feeling so tormented about the whole thing because she was so sure that it actually happened. And so desperate for some answers, Candace hired a private investigator because if John hadn't done it, who did? Now this private investigator was called Larry O'Brien and he believed Candace, so he was determined to find out what had happened to her. Now our Larry here is a very sneaky man. One night he followed Dr. John in his car and he waited until John was inside of his house so he could break into his car and do a little sniffing around. Now in these times people actually didn't really bother to lock their cars so it was very easy for him to break in. And after searching the car excessively for anything that would be admissible for DNA testing, Larry managed to find a few strands of hair and some chapstick. So he took it to Candace and Candace had actually borrowed some money from her parents to be able to get the samples tested at an independent testing lab. Now, unfortunately, the hairs were rootless, so they weren't admissible for testing. However, the chapstick was admissible and actually came back a positive match to the DNA found on Candace's body. What? However, the DNA did not match the blood samples taken from Dr. John. I know, right? The plot thickens. So obviously this was a big reason to start looking for more suspects but also to start looking into John again because the chapstick was found in his car as Bailey Sarian would say suspish. Now they immediately stumbled on a problem though because private investigator Larry O'Brien had actually illegally obtained the chapstick from John's car by breaking in so none of this would actually be admissible if they'd ever take it to court. So the police called John and obviously being very frustrated that this situation apparently is still not over and that his family once again had to go through all of this, he once again obviously was very eager to prove his innocence. So he said, yes, yeah, sure, once again, I'll give you the butt sample. So he goes to the police station, right? And this time it's highly monitored. There were multiple law enforcement officers, lawyers, nurses, doctors, everybody was there to make sure that everything was done properly. And then to the relief of John and his family, once again the test showed no match to the DNA found on Candace's body or the chapstick found in John's car. Now Candace was devastated with these results because she really thought this was her last chance at proving that something had happened to her. But at this point with another test coming back negative, obviously no one was believing her anymore. And people actually started saying really mean things about her. People were actually saying that these drugs had given her some wild dreams. I know. That had a reason though because some newspaper published that Versed, the drug she had been given, was prone to give a patient hallucinations sometimes. So obviously the entire public and the media went just like, oh that's what happened, she was just hallucinating or she's actually doing it for attention. So obviously Candace was having a really shitty time but even though she was plagued by this trauma and all these people saying these nasty things about her. She decided that she would do everything to move on with her life and especially with her daughter as well. Just she wanted to give her daughter the best life she could and thought well this really was my last shot so then I'll just try my hardest to move on from it. But then on April 25th 1997 something would break this case wide open. Lisa Schneeberger's daughter, so John's stepdaughter, she tells her mother that in the middle of the night John had actually come into her room, injected her with something and then in the morning when she woke up she actually found an empty condom wrapper and immediately she took her mum to her room and showed her the condom wrapper and horrified Lisa actually remembers a time when her daughter had waken up very groggy in the morning and had said something about John coming in in the middle of the night and giving giving her an injection of some sort. And at the time, she actually immediately asked John about it, who immediately admitted to it. He said that night, her stepdaughter actually had a really, really bad cough and he had hurt her, so he had given her some medication for the coughing so that she would be able to get some sleep. And obviously, John being a well-liked and well-known high-praised doctor and her trusted husband, Lisa believed him. So Lisa asked her daughter about this and her daughter hesitated for a bit and then actually proceeds to tell her mother that for the past two years, so since she was 13, John had actually occasionally been coming to her room in the middle of the night and giving her injections and she also remembered being sexually assaulted many times by him. At 13! Ew! Come on man! Eh. Now Lisa asked her daughter, why did you never tell me about this? I could have helped you, why did you never come to me? And her daughter said, well mum, you didn't believe Candace that time so I had no reason to believe that you'd actually believe me. I know. Oh, 
Now Lisa immediately went in snooping around in her husband's office because she never really went in there. And after not even searching for that long, in a cupboard on a very high shelf way up, she finds his hidden stash. Secretly stuffed away, there were syringes, there were condoms, and also a lot of bottles of the Versed sedative drug that he had given Candace. And now, as it turns out, also to his 15-year-old stepdaughter. All this time, she didn't even have a hint of the fact that the man she thought was her loving, devoted and caring husband had actually been a sexual predator all these years. Now Lisa, obviously feeling all sorts of horrified, immediately takes so obviously the police get on it, they immediately arrest John, they take him to the police station for questioning and of course for, you guessed it, DNA sample. However, this time they took all his DNA because last time they had just drawn his blood this time they took his hair they took his nail clippings some saliva and also once again they took his blood sample they were just like can never be too sure let's just take the whole shebang I got it <laughs> hold on wait now as this case was concerning a minor and obviously evidence of sexual assault has to be collected and processed as quickly as possible the test results came back fairly quickly and guess what they all came back as a positive match they were a positive match to the dna found on candace the dna found on the chapstick in john's car and dna found on lisa's daughter and this news hits kipling like a bomb people were shocked they would never have guessed but obviously now there was evidence and candace was finally being believed and i know you're thinking right now okay cool but how the fuck did those dna tests come back negative before everyone watched his blood being drawn how are now these tests coming back positive and and all of a sudden everybody's like okay it's solved well get this it's pretty messed up just so you know but it's 100 one of the sickest plot twists i've ever come across listen john schneeberger's trial started in 1999 and during this trial he confessed to everything on that specific night on halloween 1992 john schneeberger had indeed intentionally drugged candace that night sadly he also indeed sexually assaulted her whilst he thought she was unconscious but she was actually only paralyzed and when the next morning candace left the hospital he quickly realized that he was in a bit of a pickle because actually dna testing was so reliable now Nowadays. So John came up with a solution. He went to his work, to the hospital. He checked if no one was around and made sure that no one could walk in. And then in secret, he surgically inserted a tube into his own arm right next to where his own vein was. The tube John inserted was a 15 centimeter Penrose drain and he had filled it with the blood of one of his male patients. Let that sink in. He even was smart enough to add anticoagulants to make sure that the blood would stay fluid. So immediately the police reviewed all the footage of all the times that John had given them his blood. And now knowing this, they actually noticed that he would always immediately offer his left arm and actually the third time he had given them his blood, that that was the time when P.I. Larry O'Brien had broken into his car and found the chapstick. There's actually a frame where for a brief second he rolls up his sleeve and you can actually see the tube. Ugh. And for a brief moment you can see the tube protruding from his arm. And what I didn't tell you before is that that time when the nurse was drawing his blood she actually had a really hard time doing so. And she had to actually try three times before anything came out. And then later on, when she was testing the blood, because this is also on film, she would comment, and you can hear her say and see her say this, that she thought it was really odd that to her, for some reason she couldn't explain, the blood didn't look really fresh. Because usually blood looks fluid and kind of warm, dark red. And this was kind of sticky and thick and brown colored. And on the video, she says she finds this very odd. It's a little strange in that, you know, like the blood doesn't look... Doesn't look like it's been drawn for a long time. Well, actually, that was because this blood was two fucking years old. Duh. What I also didn't tell you, and what Candace also didn't know, that actually that time, the blood was declared unfit for DNA testing. So when they needed to compare the DNA from the chapstick and the blood to John's, they actually had nothing to work with. But because John had already voluntarily given his DNA twice before, and because he was just such a well-liked and loved man that everybody knew, they just kind of let it go. 
true. Now, upon further questioning, John actually admitted that the blood in that vein was actually from one of his male patients called Danny Zebo. And that meant that if the police had done some mass DNA testing in Kipling, this Danny Zebo guy would actually be convicted for the sexual assault and drugging of Candace Fonagy. And no, John turns out to be a real dick, doesn't he? <laughs> so after seven years after this horrific incident had happened, John Schneeberger was finally convicted for sexual assault, administering a noxious substance, as well as obstruction the course. Oh my god, do you guys know how exciting this is for me? It's like celebration. He was not, however, convicted of sexual assault on his 15-year-old stepdaughter because for some reason I couldn't find on the internet, there apparently wasn't enough conclusive evidence, so he never actually had to pay for that. Mm, yeah, barf. He did, however, get convicted for the crimes on Candace, and for this, do you want to guess how many years he got for this? It's because that's, it blows my mind. Are you ready? This man got six years in prison for everything he had done. And also he was stripped from his license to practice medicine by the College of Physicians in Saskatchewan. Now Lisa Schneeberger quickly divorced him but actually for her this wasn't really over. Now Lisa Schneeberger immediately divorced him and she changed her name back to Lisa Dillman. Now get this because this just gets my blood boiling because John was only accused of sexual assault towards his stepdaughter. He was actually allowed by law, it was his right, to see his biological daughters, the ones he had with Lisa, one more time before he went to prison. And I couldn't find anything to confirm this, but I think they were around five, six years old at the time. And obviously Lisa was like, oh hell no. So Lisa said she refused to take her daughters to see him and get this, Lisa was actually fined $2,000 for breaking the law. And she was also forced to take her daughters to go and see him that time before he went into prison. Like, eh? They even said if Lisa refused that time, she would be fined an additional $5,000. I thought Canada was like this amazing country with this great justice system, but obviously I didn't know enough yet. Now, when that day came and she took her daughters to see him, they actually said, Mommy, I don't want to see him. And when they were there, they would actually hide behind their mother's back. I know. Now, luckily, social workers were also present and they put a stop to it because they were like, we're traumatizing these children. This needs to stop right now. Thank the Lord. John was finally in prison, but Lisa had a really horrible feeling about him only being locked up for just six years, and she was terrified for her kids. So what she did is she went and called the Canadian Immigration Office, because, as you might remember, John was actually born in Africa. So Lisa called them up and she told them that he had actually lied on his application form to become a Canadian citizen. And how she justified this was that when John was asked during his application for citizenship if he had ever been involved in a police investigation, John had said no. However, he applied for this citizenship after the whole Candace thing had happened. And even though he was determined innocent, officially he had been involved in a police investigation. And I thought that was very smart of Lisa, but unfortunately the day that Lisa and Candace and everyone else was dreading would come way sooner than they all would have thought. After only serving four years in prison, John Schneeberger was released on parole. Like, why? But okay. However, because Lisa had reported him to the immigration office, they revoked his Canadian citizenship in December of the same year, and he was scheduled to be reported back to Africa. John would actually spend his last months in Canada working as a construction worker on a demolition team. And get this, because I found this very weird, John's friends and people that were close to him before actually stood by him. They even started a petition to keep him there, which was denied. So then they thought, well, at least we can do the appropriate thing and throw him a massive going away party. And at this party, John was even doing a fun garage sale, give away all his stuff before he was moving to Africa. And this all under the enjoyment of a fresh glass of wine, his friends, and just, you know, having a wee fucking good time. Those people were dumb. And then in July 2004, John Schneeberger was deported back to go and live with his mother in a town called Durban in South Africa. Now his older brother, Bill, who lived close by, I and I talked about him for like one second in the beginning of the video. He actually was a cardiothoracic surgeon, but also an avid believer in his brother's innocence. So quickly, Bill becomes John's biggest advocate, and Bill here actually goes around different hospitals 
petitioning to give John his license back so that John could practice medicine again somewhere there in Africa. Bill? No. Shh, you muppet. However, luckily his story was well known around the area, so bless all of us, Bill's requests were denied and no one wanted to hire John anymore. Today, John Schneeberger still lives with his mother in Durban, South Africa, where he works in a catering business and John is said to have turned to religion, hoping that a devoted spiritual life will redeem him of his sins. Sure, John, keep dreaming. And back in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, Candace Vonnegut is actually now happily married and she works as a continuing care assistant for an addiction facility. And yeah, that concludes today's story. Can you even imagine that that dude is free right now? Like, look, I'm not a big fan of long prison sentences because I feel like we need to help people that make bad decisions and choices become better people and not only just punishing them for what they did wrong because I mean long term what's that gonna do right? Now don't get me wrong because I definitely do think that some people need to be locked up for their own safety and the people's safety so I'm not trying to defend anyone here and especially not John. It's just that I think the way we do prison right now is not getting us any closer to eliminating crime. However only four years for this dude after everything we now know he did and the fact that he put a vein into his arm uh, then four years bit mild dude bit mild like especially if you think of the fact that there's people surfing life sentences for only carrying a small bag of the devil's letters only once like <laughs> Also in 2003, uh, they actually made a movie on him with John Hanna playing John Schneeberger and supermodel Estelle Warren playing Candace Fonagy. And I haven't seen it yet, so I can't tell you if it's any good or not. Sorry. If you have, let me know in the comments. So yeah, that concludes today's story. Da -da -da -da. Really curious to know what you think, so let me know your thoughts in the comments so we can chat on about this case. And yeah, if you liked it, you would make my day if you'd subscribe. Uh, a uh, bonus selling point is that as of now I'm not yet monetized so as for now these videos won't have any ads yay and yeah go have a smashing day be kind to yourself be kind to people around you say hi to mum from me and I will see you again next week bye, bye.